we really don't care what you believe. You can be an atheist, you can be agnostic, you can be seeking, you can be questioning, you can be completely secular, you can be spiritual, you can be part of it, any of a number of different spiritual paths, and you are absolutely welcome to learn from this. I don't care if you're observing because of academic curiosity. So when I reference these archetypes, when I reference these gods or deities, I don't care if you believe in them. Um, you're still welcome to make use of the recipe, whether or not you believe in the deity that it is designed for. And I think that necromancy can still be helpful to people who don't actually believe that they can raise the spirits of the dead. Um, I think that having a communication with people that you have loved and lost, whether you feel like they are an independent being that is just all and existing on their own and someone that you can communicate with even though their body is dead, or you think that you're just having an internal mental exercise with a projection of the personality that you've created, I still think that's helpful. Um, and I don't really care where on that spectrum you fall or how you make use of these, so long as you don't blame me if you get arrested. So, moving right along. Um, the figure that I'm in particular talking about being useful to understand the existence of as an archetype, whether or not you believe in it, is called the Queen of Bones. Um, the belief is that there is a separate process for the body than the spirit of decay and breaking down that is valuable in that it works upon bodies rather than souls. Um, one thing that I've found in Western culture, with how diverse we are from the process of death, with how distant we are from the process of decay, with um, how sterile and homogenized our existence has become, is that we think of death primarily as the, oh, did they go to heaven? Did they go to hell? Are they still with me? Um, and we try very hard not to think about what happens to the bodies at all. Um, we find that gross, we find that icky when it comes to funereal services. Um, that's a very sterile thing where the body that you're looking at is, is preserved or, or not even present. Um, where the body you're looking at has been filled with formaldehyde and is wearing layers of makeup to make it look as if they are just sleeping. Um, we spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on hermetically sealed coffins. Um, we try and keep the body preserved as long as possible in the grave. Uh, I think this is actually really damaging to the grieving process. Um, and that because we don't want to think about what happens to the body, and because we're scared to think about what happens to the soul, um, we've sort of put that process over there as something to delay as long as possible and to not think about. Um, and there becomes this almost allergy to talking about the dead honestly. How many times have you heard, don't speak ill of the dead? Right. Um, we try when someone is gone to only say the positive things about them. Um, we try not to think about the fact that their bodies are breaking down or returning to the soil or that they'll feed something new. Now there's starting to be a younger generation that's sort of going like, hey, these chemicals that we preserve these bodies with are very unhealthy. Um, they're actually doing a lot of damage to the soil. They're doing a lot of damage to the groundwater. I don't want this. There's a lot of people sort of protesting the commodification of death, where it's a new huge expense with satin-lined coffins, and are you using the mahogany or the ebony, and exactly how much money do you need to save up so that your kids don't go bankrupt burying you? And there's starting to be a protest of this. Um, now, unfortunately, it's coming a little late, and we're seeing things in the news where families who aren't being able to raise the money that they owe for the burial of their relatives are being sued, or the, the dead are being dug up and moved to different cheaper plots. Um, there are, what are they called, uh, crematoriums that are holding hostage families' ashes. So the commodification's gone pretty far. But in particular, we have a very strange relationship with this. We have a strange relationship with the idea of decay. We have a strange relationship with the idea that we all kind of wind up as worm food and we're supposed to. Um, to the point where I've had students recently 
say that it's gross that I feed my plants with blood. That I use blood meal and decaying fish to feed my plants. Yeah, but they said it was gross. And that they would never be able to do that. Yeah, so... There's a figure in Appalachian Conjure that represents the archetype of breaking down bodies. Not breaking down the soul, not breaking down the spirit. That's not her purview. Um, that's not her area of influence. Her area of influence is what happens when you bury your cat? What happens when you bury the family dog? What happens when you bury grandpa? Um, and in particular, she breaks things down to make new things. She's called the Queen of Bones. Um, and in particular, we talked a little bit, I don't remember if it was during the class on iron or the last class on necromancy about the Appalachian figure Daddy Down Below, who's sort of in charge of the, which, that was during iron? Yeah. Okay, so that's during <coughs> iron. Um, Daddy Down Below being this figure who manages the, the hollow hills, who manages the, the depths of the mines, that that's his, that's his purview. Yes, except for the bodies of the dead which are hers. Um, now, I want to be clear, this is not in every bit of Appalachian Conjure. This is not in every bit of Appalachian cunning or clever work or the ways of things. This is just in the particular region I was learning from. You will find these figures under different names as you go up or down the trails. You will find these figures just left out of certain versions of this. Now, specifically, there were two plants that belonged to her that were hers, um, beyond basically things that grow in a graveyard. Um, but wherever you found them, ghost pipe mushrooms and mulet belonged to the Queen of Bones. They were her plants. Um, and if you worked with those plants, it was a way of getting in touch with her energies in particular. And one of the ways you could do this was by making what were called fingers of the dead torches. Um, mulein is often called the candle wick plant. Uh, have any of you ever seen mulein, the plant? Okay. So it grows with these unfolding leaves that sort of come out, and then this stalk that grows straight up that's covered in flowers. Right. Um, now the stalks can be big, very big, um, the size of a torch, easily. Now, in survivalism, you can be taught how to take these and wrap them in a little bit of accelerant and use them as a torch when you're, when you're out in the middle of nowhere with no light source. Um, but in this particular practice, you take these dead flower stalks and you dip them in several layers of wax and then you burn them as torches. You can do this out in the wilderness. You can get 13 of them, or you can get whatever magical number that you're using of these dead stalks and dip them in animal tallow or beeswax and literally stake them in the ground to make your magical circle, and you light each one. And in so doing, you are summoning her energies, her attention. So you could do this if you were going to be raising something from a graveyard, bringing a spirit back because the graveyard is her purview, or you could use this if you were trying to tap into her archetype. Um, one of the things I found with just strange Western American culture, we don't want to let things die. We don't want to let go of an opportunity that isn't working out for us. We don't want to let go of toxic influences. We don't want to say, you know what, this was good while it lasted, but it's time for me to stop investing energy here. Um, I've noticed people will try and keep relationships going long after all value to all parties has been exhausted. Um, and I think it has something to do with our absolute terror of failure, um, of being seen as not giving it absolutely your all to keep something going. Um, and there tends to be a problem of self-recrimination and blame in especially the younger generation. You know, they're, they're growing up being told that everything is their fault all the time. I mean, it's their fault that the napkin industry is dying. It's their fault that nobody buys diamonds anymore. It's, it's their they're fault that we have a... the shitty dog pet food industries. Right? I saw that one today. 
today, yes. today I yes. saw the article that said millennials are killing the, the poor quality dog food industry. It was just sort of like, good? I'm like, <laughs> let it die? I feel like, I feel like that's probably for the best. I don't know. I read an article that said that millennials were, were killing the mayonnaise industry <laughs> because we're too into sriracha. We're yeah. cheap. We're killing yeah. food stores, too. It's almost like a whole generation is saddled with crippling debt and is absolutely starving. We have the highest debt roof of any generation because college prices keep going up, 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 and you need to go to college. Yep. So, I think because everything is everyone's fault anyway, and we are encouraged not to examine why we feel responsible for things outside of our control. We don't want to let things die. You don't always have to use something that works for necromancy to involve a human spirit. You can use it to put something to death. You can use it to put something down into a grave and let it rest and let it sleep and let it not take your energies anymore. You can use it to break down a connection that is not healthy for you anymore. Um, one of the reasons I've summoned the Queen of Bones is to say, like, hey, I've done everything that I can think of mentally and emotionally to sever an unhealthy connection with this person, and nothing's working. I need this connection to die. I need it to break down and not exist anymore. So when you, when I'm talking about a ritual like this, which actually is legal, so long as it's legal for you to do fires in your area, and please make sure that it is legal and safe for you to do fires in your area. California is on fire, so like, safe fire usage outside, please. Um, yeah, there's actually a forest fire caused by someone going out and doing a ritual, I think it was two years ago. So, be careful with your ritual fires. Make sure that they're all the way out before you leave. Anyway, if there's smoke, it's not out. You want to make sure that in order to use these as fingers of the dead torches, the stem is entirely dried, but not to the point where it is crispy and crumbly. Um, so if you're talking oh, yes. Actually, thank you the ones that have started to like shrivel and blacken and powder, that's yeah. too dry. Um, you want it at the point where it's not damp, but it's not crumbling at the touch either. The same thing goes for using the leaves to make fingers of the dead candles. Um, you will also find these referred to as hag candles or hag fingers or hag torches. It's all the same thing. It's really where you are in the mountains. For one thing, the same figure that I call the queen of bones just gets called the bone hag in different areas. And they're the same figure just slightly adjusted in the same way that in some areas of the Appalachian Mountains, Witch Queen Perkta is called Witch Queen Perkta, and in other areas she's called Baba Perkta, and in other places she's called Granny Perkta. Same figure, just slightly different adjusted recognition and names. So if you don't want to take the torches out into the wilderness and burn them in a ceremonial circle, you can also fill a vessel with sand and stick the torch down into the sand so that it won't tip and light it. Um, obviously you need a fireproof burning dish in order to do this. Um, if you want to make candles rather than the torches, you want to take smaller pieces of the stalk or an entire leaf and you just kind of curl it up a little bit and you dip them in wax. Wax that you've melted in a double boiler and you just keep dipping until you get it to the thickness that you want and then you clip it up to dry and then you can use it whenever you'd like to. You can in fact find, I did check before I taught the class today, you can find YouTube videos that show you what these look like burning. Um, mostly from the survivalism community where they're trying to show like, hey, if you're ever really desperate, you can make a candle out of these. Um, there's one guy on there who wrapped it in aluminum foil and lit it on fire with accelerant 
that made a pretty epic torch. Um, now, something to keep in mind with mulin, it is a mild psychotropic, it is a mild hallucinogen, and it's already quite commonly used in necromantic practices. It was incredibly popular in Rome, and in fact, the, uh, the Roman funereal rituals used the dried the dried stalks of mulin dipped in tallow, and they would literally mark out the path for the funeral mourners to walk with these torches lit. Let's talk about some working with the grim. There is a belief in the Appalachian Mountains that the first spirit buried in a graveyard winds up being the guardian spirit of that graveyard um, until they are unearthed and someone else takes their place. So a lot of the time in old graveyards, they would bury a dog first so that the guardian spirit of a graveyard would be a person that's not permitted to move on. So there's this idea that there are hounds in particularly associated with graveyards. Um, and a lot of the rituals through the area call about, talk about having to make contracts with the black dogs that guard the graves before you can do work in graveyards. Um, there's all manner of ways that they encourage you doing this. In particular, most of them call for black dog hair. There are some recipes that call for more than hair, that call for a body part or something similar. I see no reason why you could not wait until an animal had died of natural causes and then make use of, of their body parts. I certainly would not feel it would be appropriate to kill an animal for the ritual. So, um, right, the black hounds. Um, there are some people who work with the energies of the dead that bind the spirit dogs at graveyards and sort of make them do as commanded. I have never understood commanding a spirit until you absolutely have to, but I think that part of that is that I've always felt that you should treat magic like you do everyday life. That, um, so I'll, I'll use cursing as an example. There are a lot of people out there who will tell me that I absolutely must not curse. Um, they tend to cite Wiccan laws to tell me that I can't ca curse, and I'm not Wiccan. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being Wiccan, but I'm not. I don't follow the Ten Commandments either. <laughs> like, uh, I'm not Thou Christian. Thou shalt not have no other idols before me. Yeah, I don't worship idols anyway, but I certainly don't worship Yahweh, so... Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't follow that, so, um, and another one I've been told is it will come back on me three times. Again, that's Wiccan, I'm, I'm not. Um, however, I do treat cursing like I would treat hitting somebody. I'm not going to hit somebody for no reason. I'm not going to do it unless I feel like that's the last resort that I have in that situation. Are there circumstances I absolutely would hit someone in? Oh, yeah. If I see someone laying their hands on someone else, probably gonna interfere. Um, actually, I'll give an example. Um, one of the first Renaissance fairs that Ian and I ever worked, we watched a woman hit her kid. Not like a small spanking, which I don't approve of anyway, that's still hitting a kid, but like hit them hard, hard enough that the kid fell. And Ian chased after her and ended up laying his hands on her. Um, and security came and got involved and he had to be like, look, this happened and everyone else had to come over and say, we witnessed this too. That's a person I would curse because I would also hit that person. I would hit someone who was a domestic abuser. I would hit someone who was a rapist. I would hit someone who was trying to hurt someone that I loved or cared about. I would hurt, hit someone who was hurting someone who was homeless or vulnerable or dependent upon them for care. I would absolutely hit somebody who hurt their animals. Therefore, I would also curse those people. If you would not do an action with your hands, don't do it with your magic. It is just as personal. Um, 
there are some people who would say it's more personal. I'm not going to get into that debate. But if you wouldn't do it with your hands, don't do it with your magic. And I always get somebody commenting going, oh, well, what about, you know, if, if you're just worried about the consequence of getting caught? You know, you don't want to be arrested. Um, well, that's when the whole using magic instead of your hands becomes a beneficial way of tackling things. Because um, I can curse a domestic abuser that the police won't touch. That's why I would use my magic. And this comes down to it in this particular situation. I wouldn't lock an animal in a cage. I wouldn't take an animal and stick it in a cage. So why would I use my magic to bind and cage the spirit of the black hound that guards the graveyard? Why would I do that? Um, now, are there spirits I would lock in a cage? Yeah, absolutely. If they're harassing or hurting or threatening someone and they won't stop, then sure, I'll lock them in a cage, but I'll try everything else first. I mean, the first thing you try is to tell it to knock it the fuck off. <laughs> like... And yes, that is, in fact, exactly what I say. <laughs> you know, what do you use when you're performing exorcisms? I don't know, I'm mouthy. It's about the same thing I always use. In particular, the most classic, like, way of summoning the black hounds is to use a brush made of human hair, an ink which we're going to cover in a minute, called Necromancer's Ink and you write your summoning and you burn it in a graveyard. And in particular, there's this belief that smoke transitions between the planes and is a way of getting the invitation. Now, the commanding tool that it is recommended by many, many versions of this practice is made from the femur of a dog or a horse. Um, I don't feel like that's necessarily necessary, I have had equal luck using a stick that I have wrapped cloth around to bind black dog hairs to the stick. Um, and that worked just fine for me. Um, the fact that the femur is traditional does not mean that you have to use it. Now, this is where I tend to really disagree with other necromantic practitioners because most of them write on the femur I bind you, black hound. And some people write it in Latin, and some people write it in their own hex tongue, and some people sign it with their hex mark. I don't do that at all. Um, I don't feel like that is necessary in order to invite it to work with you. Um, I basically do what I always do. I go out, I make a circle, I say, in this circle, the only things that may step are what I call. The things that I call must be what step into it. Nothing else is allowed to pretend to be it or take its place or lie to me about its identity. The things that I invite into the circle cannot harm me. They cannot act against me and they cannot deceive me. And they must leave when I tell them to leave. And then I invite it to come. Now, one of the intriguing things about working with the black hounds of a graveyard is that they don't have the mentality of a dog. They have transitioned and become a guardian spirit. So you can actually have a conversation with them. Now, there are some dogs that are really smart that you can have a conversation with anyway, and there are some dogs that, well, we'll just go with not. They're not that <laughs> smart. Um, now, intriguingly, I have not yet encountered a negative black hound of a graveyard, but I have been told that other people who practice this have, that they found that people killed a dog and the dog didn't want to die, and then they bound it to a graveyard against its will, and it's unhappy that it's there, and it's become malicious, it's become malevolent. In which case, let it go. Let it go and ask another spirit to come take its place. One of the things I have never understood about some of the, the practitioners I've talked to is they're like, oh yeah, I encountered this really malicious black hound guarding this graveyard and, you know, I never went back. And it's like, okay, but what happened after that? Did you just leave it there being unhappy? So the method that my grandmother always used was to first command the energies of an area to say, 
you know, I am willing to release you. I am willing to give you your freedom to move on. I am willing to unbind you from this place. But if I do so, you must not turn against me. You must actually move on. You can't stay here unbound and still be malicious and malevolent. You have to go. Um, and then you can find wherever the dog was buried, if possible. If not, you have to spread your energies through the entire graveyard. Um, and you would use something that represents the laying down of things. So coffin nails would be good, or a mugwort, ruin, um, wormwood, um, grave soil. And you essentially say, with these objects, I represent the laying down of you into your grave, that you may rest, that you may sleep, that you may move on. Um, and then back it up with your own energy. Uh, don't just stand there saying it. Actually push for that to happen. Um, if that fails, then you could do something like summon another spirit to escort them. If you had a guardian entity, a familiar that you worked with, a servitor that you worked with, you could sort of say, please come help escort this dog onwards so that it could move on and rest. Um, you know, there... There are other methods. There are dismissing incenses that you can use. Uh, black star oil. I'll go ahead and skip to that. And I have not forgotten that we're coming back to dark contract oil. My great grandmother used this oil she called black star oil for summoning and dismissing. Um, she said that it summoned in all directions and then vanished in all directions. So it contains black copal or black frankincense. Brugino or Bru Negro resin or black frankincense oil if you can't find that. Um, clove oil, star anise oil, and like blooming jasmine oil. And when she was using it for dismissing, she would shave a little bit off of a rusty graveyard nail into it and burn it to dismiss it. So that's something that you could use to sort of say like, okay, move on. Um, all right, so I said we would come back up to dark contract oil. Does anyone have any questions about the calling of a grim or a, a graveyard hound to talk to before we move into the oil I mentioned? Have you ever encountered graveyards with more than one grim or hound? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, in particular, there are some very large graveyards okay. over on the East Coast that are like many, 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 many acres of dead people. Quite a few in there, yeah, they they would often have more than one. Okay. Um, I've also found that in some cases it doesn't matter if there was ever actually a black dog buried on the premises. So many people believe that there are graveyard hounds that act as the wards and protectors of the of the space. That sometimes graveyards have one that don't have a black dog that buried in them. Have you um, ever encountered? encountered farms that ended up with grim on them, not necessarily with dark. Uh, yes, and in particular, a lot of people in the region view the appearance of a grim or a black hound as a sign that something is going to die. Okay. Um, which in movies that I've seen this belief repeated, that's always a negative thing. Everyone always feels like that's like, oh no, someone I love is going to be taken from me. But it's not always a negative thing. And I feel like that has to do with the fact that we're not really agrarian anymore. And people don't think of death as a thing that has to happen. Like, the crops have to die for the new crops to come in. That's, that's a thing. That has to happen. Um, right, so we were going to touch on Dark Contract Oil and Necromancer's Ink both of which were referenced in the spell that we just went over with the calling of a black hound. Before I go into how to make the dark contract oil, when you make a contract with any kind of entity, whether it's a black hound, whether it's the queen of bones, whether it's something having to do with, like not having to do with necromancy at all, be explicit. Be very clear about what you're offering and what you're not. And understand that you can end a contract at any time. And that in particular, in the practice of what gets called conjure or cunning, you are not agreeing to worship them. You are not agreeing to submit to them. You are not agreeing to bow and scrape and obey 
and have any kind of a dogmatic practice. You are not telling them that you will do as they say. And any figure that sort of goes like, oh, well, you can't work with me unless you lick my boots and give me an offering every day may not be an entity you want to work with. One of the reasons to pursue something like cunning or clever work is to claim your own power. The power that you and every other living being intrinsically has, rather than the power that is given to you by some kind of a deity or a god. Now, there are branches of Appalachian Conjure that have syncretized with Christianity and which use the Bible verses and, and the prayers to Yahweh or the recognition of Christ as part of the power. I'm not trying to denigrate that as a potential path. That's just not the cunning that I grew up in. Um, I will say that the cunning workers who taught me recognized Jesus. Now they recognized him as a prophet rather than a god, and they believed that in the three days that he was dead, he was actually in the hollow hills with the fairies. It, it's, it's its own religion. I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, one of the beliefs that was intrinsic through what I learned was that you should not have to beg for the power to be free. So if you're practicing this as an effort to understand the universe or your place within it or to claim your own power or to seek the, the freeing of yourself or the, the dropping of your fetters, swearing to serve something is kind of contraindicated. Um, now, if you're doing this because you want to find something to serve, that's up to you. Read the fine print, know that you can end the contract at any time. Something to keep in mind as you move forward, y'all heard the story of Job? And the whale? And the whale, right? Yahweh says, I want Job to go be a prophet in Nineveh. Can he make him? No. Can he snap his fingers and force Job to go to Nineveh? No. No, no. He acts like a gigantic bully and has him thrown off his ship and swallowed by a whale because he couldn't just pick a prophet that wanted to go to Nineveh. <laughs> Some issues with Yahweh. Um, but he couldn't make him. In any of the stories of the gods, they have to ask. They have to get you to say yes. And at the, any point, if you say, no, I'm done, they have to acknowledge that. You see that over and over again in Hellenic mythology, in Roman mythology, in, in Christian mythology. So when I talk about something like dark contract oil and making a contract with a graveyard deity, you do not have to worship. If you do choose to worship, try and make that an informed choice and do it as safely as you can. And if you choose to cease worshiping, you can do so at any time. Anyway. Black Arts Oil, or Dark Contract Oil, is a classic Appalachian recipe found in many branches of conjure, cunning, clever work, root work, and hoodoo. Every family and or school of thought has their own particular recipe, so please note that this is just one of the many possible ways that you can go about making this. Although some practitioners use Black Arts Oil for cursing or maledictions, my teachers used it for making compacts and contracts with beings and entities that were considered dark, such as spirits of the night and or death. I've never really felt comfortable with the name of the oil being black arts or dark arts oil because I think it verges into racism and the trap of thinking of one kind of magic as light and therefore good or white and therefore good and one kind of magic as dark or black and therefore bad. It is, however, the common name. If you were to go online and try and find other people's recipes, you're going to have to use dark contract or black arts oil to find it. Um, this is sometimes also called uh, dark command oil or black command oil. It's, uh, it's different than command and compel. That's a different oil. Anyway. For this, you need half a dropper of essential oil of black sweet patchouli. Half a dropper essential oil of black pepper, a pinch of valerian root, a pinch of black mustard seeds lightly ground, a pinch of Spanish moss, a pinch of mulin, 
nine whole black peppercorns, lightly ground, a pinch of powdered sulfur, a pinch of black dog hair, the ashes of three black rooster feathers, a generous pinch of graveyard soil, and carrier oil of your choice. You powder these all together, and you blend it into your carrier oil. And then you can use this to anoint the stick that you're trying to use to command the black hound. You can use it to anoint a, a necromancer's wand, which we'll get into in a little bit here. Um, you can use it to anoint yourself before you go and try and make your contract with the black hound. Um, you could add a little bit of powdered ghost pipe or a little bit of um, e brain. Um, or a little bit of the, the soil from the graveyard that you're trying to work with and use it to summon the Queen of Bones. You could add a little bit of powdered animal bone and use it to summon the Queen of Bones. So you can adjust this as you like. Um, I, in particular, use this to anoint my contract paper that I've carefully written up all of my contract with, and then I burn that. Um, by the way, keep a copy. When I was just starting out, I would write out my contract by hand, and I would burn it to sort of be like, hey, if you accept it, give me a sign. Also keep a copy so you remember in the future what you agreed to and what your terms were so that it can't go like, well, do you remember what the contract says? Yeah, just, just for the record. Is there a um, story in there? No? What? <laughs> Absolutely not. I've never made any mistakes. I'm perfect. So you should try and be like me and never make any mistakes. <laughs> Did that come across as enough sarcasm that you know that I have absolutely screwed up before? <laughs> it worked out. It's okay now. Alright. Ink for necromancy. You need a handful of animal fat. Not an Ian handful. Every time I, he reads my old instructions and he's like, so, a handful, huh? His hands can, like, do this to mine. You don't need that much. Um, he's six foot five. And his hands are gigantic. Um, good, clean cotton or linen. Enough of it that you can wrap it around the parcel of animal fat. Um, a fire pit of stone or metal. Kindling and fire starting materials. A vessel for catching smoke made of metal or glass. Hot pads for your hands. Ethyl alcohol or another clear, strong alcohol like vodka, Everclear, something that's going to last a while and doesn't have a, a stinky smell. Water, a bloodletting tool, and bandages, sterilizing equipment. If ever you are going to let blood into a spell, use an actual bloodletting tool, something like a bloodletting awl. They're very easy to find. Um, in fact, my favorite tool for this is the diabetic ones that just like it clicks and it and it draws blood. They're fantastic. Doesn't look very witchy. Um, <laughs> you can put it in a dark mysterious right, bag. Right, like <laughs> put it in a dark mysterious bag and get out there in the new moon and, and be like, yes, <laughs> my cookie <laughs> tool. <laughs> okay. Um, sterile lancets are fantastic. If you're not going to use sterile lancets, please at least sterilize your tool and sterilize the area before you puncture and have sterile bandages out there with you. And please, oh my gosh, every time I watch a witchcraft movie and they're like, we're just going to cut right across the pole. Oh. I'm like, why would you do that? Nerve endings. <laughs> so many nerve endings and that cut is going to open every time you try and do anything for the next, I don't even know how many weeks. Also, you can mess up your fingers. Right, you can mess up your fingers, you can mess up your nerve response, you can mess up the tendons and things. There are easier places to get blood. Like, right here is great. Because then you're not risking anything major. Um, drives me nuts. Always bugs me. Um... Like, I just watched Sabrina, and she goes to sign her name in the Book of the Beast, and just like, <laughs> oh, Wait, why? 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 Anyway, moving right along. Mulin or mugwort or wormwood oil. Um, India ink. This is getting really hard to find. 
Um, India ink is in particular made from charred animal bones. That's one of the ingredients. And apparently they think that artists guzzle this stuff or something because it's getting really hard to find. And the last time I asked an art store, they are like, no, don't you know that's a carcinogen? Yes? Thanks? Like, you sell cadmium. I don't know what to tell you, friend. None of the stuff that artists use are particularly safe. I shouldn't eat my clay, either. <laughs> but they're doing it for the safety. This reminds me of the last time I tried to buy saltpeter somewhere. Now I just order it from a fireworks supply company and I get it five pounds at a time. That's useful for the upcoming whatever happens. Yeah, I've never needed five pounds of salt, Peter. What? <laughs> a sealing vessel to hold the ink. Do this out of the sun, preferably on a new moon. Take the handful of fat, trimmed of all flesh, and wrap it in a good cotton or linen square. In the fire pit, set a small blaze of kindling, and when there is, when you're at the point where there's good glowing embers, and it's not just like roaring flame, um, bury the parcel of animal fat within the embers. A thick black smoke will start from the parcel within the pit. It will start pretty quickly. Animal fat makes this, um, this black, greasy smoke, especially when wrapped in cloth. Catch the black, greasy smoke with the metal or glass vessel, angled so as to catch the smoke but not put the fire out, and carefully held with protected hands so as not to burn you. Seriously, wear your hot pads. I know that it's not very witchy to be out there with your, like, giant hot pads and your clicky tool, but, like, deal but with it, okay? it's safer for you. You can make the hot pads witchy, too, I'm sure. Right? Like, make make your own witchy hot pads. I don't care, but use hot pads. Be safe. You know, I'm, I'm talking from experience. Learn from my mistakes. I have so many scars from random things I really should not have done. Um, the fullness of youth and learning. Yeah. I went through a period where I was like, it's all about the aesthetics, and I need to feel witchy in order to, like, experience my power. So all my tools were, like, iron and bone, and I used a, a bone awl, um, the kind you use to punch leather for all of my bloodletting. Yeah. Um, it's not worth it. It's really not. Embrace your power while wearing the hot pads. <laughs> um, anyway. Power while being safe. Right? As my grandmother would say, there's nothing witchy about infections. <laughs> so. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, when the fire dies out, take the vessel and add um, a half a spoon or so of ethyl alcohol or, or otherwise strong clear alcohol and a few drops of water. Stir well and then just keep stirring in droplets of alcohol until you've made a dark liquid. This is lamp black. In particular, this is lamp black made from animal fat, which is used more for working with um, the spirits of the dead, whereas the lamp black made from uh, like burning a protective spell would be used for protective inks. The lamp black made um, from a candle has a different energy than the lamp black made from a fire. Anyway. Um, then, using your bloodletting tool, add droplets of your own blood, saying as you do that this blood is now your tool to command, um, this ink is now your tool to command blood and flesh, to contract and control the spirits of the dead, and to summon and dismiss the energies of the dead. Stir this in very well, then add the India ink and a few droplets of the oil to make the ink adequately dark and thick for use in writing. Bottle in a sealable vessel, keep somewhere dark. This ink, when you write up your contracts using it, one of the things that you can do is use it to dismiss the energies at the end. You can sort of, at the end of everything, you can get out another piece of paper and be like, okay, thank you, now please leave me alone until I summon you. Um, because one of the things as you're going that you, you, that you say is, I'm using this to control and command, mm -hmm. to call and dismiss. So you use it to call and dismiss. All right. Um, you can also use Necromancer's ink to make your hex mark, your, your mark of scratch, your witch's mark, which is sort of the, the mark you use as a stand-in for your power and your name, 
on items such as like poppets to dream of the dead if you're marking it with your mark you can mark it with this ink um to write letters to people you've loved and lost or say that you're say that you do what i do and you go to a spirit and you're doing automatic writing um in order to communicate with it because it's harassing the owners of the house or something you could use this ink to make it a little easier for that that gateway of communication to open. That's cool. All right. Look right now. Look where my mind is. How do you manage to be so distracting when you're not even in the room? <laughs> Talent. Having right? children, mother. <laughs> All right. So we have about 50 minutes left. Let me try it. Let's see where we're at in my notes. Let's go ahead and talk about flying incense. Um, during an earlier video, we talked about uh, grave laying as a method to communicate with the spirits, to increase your ability to sort of hone that, that hearing ability. We gave some suggestions about places you probably won't be arrested for going and doing grave laying. Ghost towns are fantastic. They almost always have a graveyard. They're, they tend not to have people who are still invested in protecting those graves, so you can go and you can do your grave laying there. Always have a grave laying buddy. Always have somebody who knows that you're going to be going out in the middle of the night and laying on a grave in a graveyard so that you, if you get arrested, they have bail money. And um, so if you have a bad trip on your necromancer's incense, there's somebody there to take you to the emergency room or call 911 and also so that there's somebody there in case I don't know, there's someone living in the graveyard who decides that you're vulnerable and they want to take advantage of your vulnerability, which is still their fault, not yours. I'm not being victim-blaming. Just have a buddy. You should have a buddy if you go out camping at night. Let alone... Buddies are important. Right, I'm going to go take an entheogenic... I'm going to go take an entheogenic psychotropic substance and lay alone in a graveyard. That is a great time to have a friend. Now, obviously, you're going to want a friend who, who goes... Okay, next week's my turn rather than, what's wrong with you? You're going to hell. I've had both kinds of friends. Yeah. I have a friend who understands, even if they're not interested. Right, have, have a friend who understands, even if it's not their, their cup of tea. Um, I had someone contact me essentially to say, I don't want to put flying ointment on my skin. Um, but I still want to have a grave laying experience. I still want to be able to go out and do this. Um, so I adjusted the instructions and I found some notes of mine on making it into an incense instead that you inhale. Um, that being said, these are entheogens, they are hallucinogens, they are psychoactive, they are psychotropics. Please do your due diligence. Please Google whether or not these are safe for you, you know, whether they're contraindicated for you because you have uh, medical conditions or because you're on a medication. Um, you can use WebMD and Hippocrates in order to find this out. Always start with a super tiny amount and work your way up. I do recommend that you experiment with breathing this in before you go out and use it on a graveyard. Certainly if you're using it in a graveyard that's a sufficient distance away from civilization for you to have a good grave laying experience. You know how you react before right. you go into take, the middle of nowhere. Take a pinch and burn it in the safety of your own home before you take a handful and burn it in a graveyard three hours from town. Um, that being said, I am of course not recommending that you do anything and nothing I say should constitute medical advice because I'm not a medical professional. Triage training in the military does not count. Right. So, you're going to take myrrh, ground, myrrh resin, ground, black copal or black frankincense, ground, mugwort, wormwood, damiana, um, which is illegal to use in certain states, and no, I don't remember which states it's illegal, and it's not illegal in Nevada. Um, Salvia divinorum, also illegal to possess in certain states, not illegal in Nevada. Know your state um, laws and the herbs. And one single leaf, one single leaf of datura. And if you've never used datura again, start off with like, start off with like, uh, eight, a fourth of a leaf? 
a centimeter, a square centimeter of deterrent. Work your way up, because that's a, that's a hell of a drug. Three jo- drops of black patchouli oil and several drops of strong alcohol smolder together over charcoal. So that's the, the recipe for that. You're gonna wanna go stronger on the myrrh than the copal and the wormwood. You're gonna wanna go lighter on the salvio divinorum, the damiana, and the datura. Um, if you go too heavy on any of those, you will land in the hospital. You will be in respiratory distress. You will have a bad experience. So adjust accordingly. Um, what you do is you go out to a grave Um, where you are safe to do so, and you lay down, and you breathe this in, and you act as if you are dead, and you let your body be released and let it rest. This doesn't work if you're terrified of that. If you're absolutely terrified of the idea that your body will eventually break down and become new things, it is not a good idea to do grave laying. If you're terrified of the idea that eventually you get to start a new adventure, that you're going to leave this body behind and either go become part of the nothing or go to whatever afterlife you believe in or, or go to reincarnation, if whatever you think happens after death is scary to you, this is not a good process for you. The idea is that by going and making yourself as one of the dead, then it is easier for them to come and talk to you. And that the more you do this, the easier it is for them to seek you out. Um, Obviously, you're going to want a sleeping bag. You're going to want things to keep you warm. You're going to want dinner out there with you. Do not eat before you do the ritual. Um, In particular, if you're using the version we covered a couple classes ago with the flying ointment, you're not supposed to eat for a couple days before you use flying ointment that gets applied to your body. It can make you violently ill. The recipe that I went over, not the recipe we went and did at the the Bone Flats. That was beginner's flying ointment. Um, I am in the process of writing one of our little pamphlets about flying ointments with sort of beginner recipes and then work your way up. The the recipe that I use in necromancy, you're not supposed to eat or drink um, before you use it for quite a few hours because you will be violently ill. You will vomit. Also, it stinks. Just, Just letting everybody know it stinks so bad. Okay, I think we said we were going to cover a necromancer's wand. Why is none of this in order? (laughs) There we go. Something to cover before I go into how to make one of these. I don't think that you have to use any tools at all. Um, Some of my most memorable rituals mentally to myself used very much the bare minimum of anything. Um, I went out to the Bone Flats in Tule Springs at one point. Have any of you ever been out there? Um, oh, yeah. No, you have. I took you. <laughs> um, if you go all the way north of Las Vegas, literally take Durango till Durango ends, all the way at the very north, um, you will be in a parking lot Um, and there will be a little teeny tiny plaque on a water pump that says Tule Springs. Um, Looking out north of the city into the the desert, you'll see these white mesas um, that stretch on for miles. Those mesas are made of calcified remains of of animals, like the, the ancient ocean that used to be here. It's all chalk and calcium and silica. Um, and it's literally bones, powdered bones. Um, now the mesas go on and down in the mesas are these looping, uh, maze-like paths. And about once a year we take the, the students of Havencraft out there and we do the first flying ointment experience, um, with sort of beginner level flying ointment. But one of my best experiences, I guess, spiritually, was to just go out there by myself, which was stupid, don't do that. Um, At least let somebody know where you're going. At least let somebody know where you're going and when you're expected back and make sure you have your cell phone on you, etc, etc. Actually, cell phones work out at Tule Springs, which is nice compared to some of the other places I've done rituals um, where cell phones don't work and lightning travels 25 miles. Yay! Anyway, um, 
that was relevant at one point. <laughs> um, the I went out and I covered myself in this broken down bone because I wanted to let go of something. I wanted it to come out of me and be broken down and me be as if dead. And I screamed and I cried and I stomped around like a, probably like a really ugly naked chicken. Um, and I cried and it got really sticky all over me. And then I went home and I took a shower and I felt much better. And I didn't have any tools out there but the dirt. And sometimes that's all you need. If you are going to use a wand, if you're going to use a magical rod, then it is my recommendation that you know how to move your own energy first. Um, you don't... The example I have always used for why this is, someone recently pointed out was ableist. So I'm trying to figure out a new way of describing this. Basically, if you learn to do it with the wand or rod first, it will be harder to learn to do it without it. If you learn to move your own energy first and then you use a wand to direct or a rod to direct, then you can sort of know that, hey, if you leave this at home, if for any reason it's under your bed and you're out there going like, damn it, I left my ritual tool bag behind. It's never happened to me, obviously. Um, you still know how to do this. You then get to decide whether you're going to have a wand, a rod, or a blasting rod. And they are different. A wand directs your energy. It narrows focus. It's like taking a laser and narrowing the beam. Um, it takes everything that you can pour into it and gives it focus. A rod connects two sources. Um, it is like a lightning rod. It carries the lightning from the sky to the ground. It is a connector between two, two locations. One can be you and one can be, um, you know, wherever you're directing your energy. But a lot of the time a rod is used to connect you and a divine force that you are contracted with or that you are um, the paladin of. Or, or that you are being the representative of that force upon the earth. Um, a rod is often held aloft. You'll see it in pictures like this because it's a way of saying like, I'm tapping in to that power. I am the lightning rod. This represents that I am the lightning rod. I am the, I am the earth that the lightning is being grounded into. So the rod connects you to the power. Um, a blasting rod takes your energy and grounds it out wherever you throw it. Um, so if you are going to try and annihilate something, if you are going to try and blast it out of existence, you take all of the force within you and understand that it is equal to the entirety of the universe, that each person is a universe entire unto themselves, and you direct it through a blasting rod as a means of taking everything in you and grounding it in something. You ever see what happens to uh, an object struck by lightning? That's the idea with a blasting rod. Um, and then there's staves and all manner of other pseudo phallic objects. Um, and a lot of the old texts, a lot of the old ceremonial texts, really play up that phallic symbolism and it gets um, very cis-centric and very cis-male praising and um, no, don't wanna. Um, so I'm not going to teach, right? All praise the mighty penis. And, if all, and obviously everyone who has a penis must be a man, right? Of course. I think I rolled my eyes so hard it hurt. Uh, there were very many different objects you could use as your necromancer's wand, starting with bones. Um, and a lot of what I got taught by my teachers is so illegal, so illegal. Um, in particular, human femurs were recommended and um, you were supposed to have an assortment of them. Um, you were supposed to have ones that were from murderers and ones that were from criminals of different sorts and ones that were from people who had died before their time, so who had died early and tragically. Um, and just these, these old 
Now, in particular, the two teachers I'm thinking of were women. These old women just thought that all bones just kind of belonged to them and that that was okay. You could just go get them. You if I yes, you can shops. purchase them legally. You can purchase human femur femurs. Um, the bone room online is a great source, um, and those are all ethical and legal, and they come with paperwork that you can wave at people and be like, no, 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 I'm allowed to own this. Unless you're in Louisiana. <laughs> Unless you're in Louisiana, because one lady ruined that for everybody. Um, Lady in Louisiana was a, a, a Tumblr witch, which there was actually a large uh, Tumblr witchcraft community. Um, she would wait until the floodwaters raised bones out of the graves, and then she'd collect them, and then she would sell them to other witches through Tumblr. And uh, that's a federal crime, sending body parts through the mail without like certain protections and legal paperwork, and especially selling body parts online. So now, in the state of Louisiana, it is illegal to possess human body parts, even if your family goes them to you. And you have paperwork. And you have paperwork. So that's been very, very difficult on the communities out there that practice hoodoo and vaudoon and, you know, ancient religions <coughs> that really should not be impacted by one jerk on Tumblr. One selfish jerk on Tumblr. Like, just be... Just be aware. Now what I have done with my bones that I use is I have definitely taken grave soil from the grave of a murderer, the grave of a thief, the, the grave of someone who's been murdered, um, the grave of someone who died before their time, and I have scattered that on the bone and said that I'm tying it into those energies as well, and I have my different ones. Um, You then basically, if you're going to use the bone, you would skip then to the process of marking it with your oil and with your ink that you've made and claiming it and giving it its job. One thing to be aware of in the culture that this comes from is that you talk to your tools. You believe that each tool has a spirit unto itself, a spirit of its own. And you essentially say like, okay, I acknowledge you, spirit. I acknowledge that you exist. I'm asking, that, I'm asking that you work with me as my tool, that when I command, you answer, that when I ask for your assistance, you aid me. This is your job, and this is your name. And then to seal that compact, you breathe upon it. If you don't want to work with human bone, I've seen people who use animal bone. I've seen, um, I actually used a camel femur for many, many, many years because somebody gave me one. And so it was like, oh, well, I have a camel femur, cool. If you do not want to use bone, then a piece from a tree in a graveyard would be sufficient. A, uh, my grandmother actually used a large chunk of rose root um, where the rose had grown up in a graveyard. I don't know if you know this about roses, they love blood and bone. Um, roses often grow where people are buried. Um, so they're already deeply associated with the dead, and then people leave roses on graves. Um, there's actually an incense in my notes that calls for the petals of the roses people leave on graves. Um, now, rather than steal the petals of other people's roses that they've left for their dead, you could just leave roses yourself and then go collect those. That would probably be better than taking other people's. Um, if you are going to have one of these wands, you do want to be very, very clear with it that it has the power not only to summon the spirits of the dead, but dismiss them as well. Um, one of the issues I've had with students is that they'll start exploring necromancy and then they get followed home a lot. Um, and then they wind up with very crowded houses. That's, that's not something that you want. Um, any of the incenses that we've gone over in this class, these things, these combinations of black copal and, and uh, black frankincense and roses and mulin and mugwort, you can pass the wand through the smoke if you want to consecrate it as a tool, or you can rub it with the oil that we covered. Just making sure that you don't treat the tool as more important as the person who is using it. 
um, you want to make sure that your tool is a force for your conjuration rather than something that you treat as the source of your conjuration. It's not, you are. Um, your tool is not the battery. It is the, the, the wire. Catalyst. There we go, nice. Um, one of the concerns I've found with Western magic, there's a delicate balance between acknowledging that everything has a power and a spirit of its own and treating that power and the spirit as if it's the one in control. So, all right, moving right along. I said we talk about the uh, necromancy incest blend that uses the roses, and then we'll take questions. And next class, we're going to pick up on the uses of different animal bones for different things, and the uses of different kinds of blood for different things. So why does one spell call for rooster blood and one spell call for lamb blood? Um, let's see. My teachers used this incense. As I mentioned, I had kind of an ethical conundrum because they would go around the graves and they'd pick a couple of petals off the roses left on any given grave. Um, that always made me a little uncomfortable. So I would just go leave roses and then come back and collect them before the gravekeeper had a chance to throw them out, and then I could keep all of the petals. Um, so figure out where you're dead or buried, figure out where you can leave roses, and then go collect them. Um, you will need grave soil, sweet narcissus, cemetery rose petals, dried mulin, dried mugwort, dried wormwood, black frankincense, and black copal. Dry the roses and the sweet narcissus. Powder all dried and resinous materials together. Smolder when <coughs> appropriating. When appropriate, not appropriating. Don't do that, don't appropriate. When appropriate for facilitating communication with the dead. We were all over the map today. Um, I'd like to pick up, like I said, with um, animal bones next time. And hopefully we can get into the history of the Hand of Glory and why they're such a big deal um and yes they absolutely did and do exist i've now seen two of them in person so yeah i read something recently it was like i don't think that the hand of glory ever actually existed i think it's myth nope scene two okay um are there any questions that anyone wants to ask while this is still running yeah a hand of glory is the hands taken off of a dead criminal um, that is mummified and then uh, holds a candle made of um, human fat. And they're used, depending upon where you're from and what you cite, some people say they're used to open gates and open doors, some people say they're used to make you invisible. My teachers in particular insisted that they were used to open the gate between the living world and the world of the dead, and that they were used to make you invisible from the archetypes of such places, so that you could move in the realm of the dead without anybody coming along and saying, hey, actually you're alive, and kicking you out, um, or any of the dead seeing you until you were ready to be seen. So, um, one of the beliefs in Appalachian cunning Appalachian conjure is that the dead know things that mankind doesn't, that the realm of the dead, that the spaces they move into, move in, that move in and through before they move on, um, and I'll touch on that in a second, are outside of our understandings of time and physics. And so they can be anywhere and any when, and they can learn the secrets of the universe. Um, now in particular, most of the teachers I had believed that this was a realm that you sort of moved in while you were still hanging around as an ancestral guidance spirit for your loved ones, while you were still processing the business that you had when you were alive, and eventually you actually moved on and transitioned either to something else or to the nothingness or, um, I, I had different teachers, they all believe something different happened after that. Um, this is how they explained a simultaneous belief in hauntings and in an afterlife. That um, there was a plane the dead could move upon 
that sometimes they didn't move on from, even when they should. And other questions? Alrighty. As a reminder, please like and subscribe and join our Patreon so that we can keep producing content. The exclusive content this month is how to perform exorcisms. The first video of that is up and the next video should be up this week.